An Ether channel is a group of links that work together as a single link. Administrators use Ether channels for various reasons. The two most common reasons for using Ether channels are they offer higher bandwidth and provide redundancy for critical network resources. Let us understand both reasons through an example. This network has two LAN segments. Both segments have connectivity through a single 1 gigabyte per second link. PC1 generates 800 megabytes of traffic for PC3. PC2 generates 600 megabytes of traffic for PC4. Both use the same link to reach their destinations. The link's bandwidth is 1 gigabyte per second. It is less than the total traffic sent by both PCs. In this case, switch 1 queues both PC's traffic. It first sends one PC's traffic. Afterward, it sends the second PC's traffic. In normal circumstances, users will not notice this delay. For example, if they are uploading, downloading, or exchanging text files, this delay does not cause any interruption. But if they are watching a movie or making a video call, this could have a negative impact on their experience. Administrators have two solutions to this problem. They can replace the link with a higher bandwidth link or use an additional link. The first solution is less suitable. It requires the supporting ports on both switches. For example, if the administrator wants to replace it with a 10 gigabytes per second link, both switches must have a 10 gigabytes per second port. In the absence of it, the administrator can't use this option. The second solution is more convenient and flexible. The administrator can create an additional link on any available ports. If more bandwidth is required, the administrator can create more links. However, this solution has a technical issue. Connecting two switches with more than one link creates a switching loop. A switching loop blocks the network from functioning. Switches use the STP protocol to find and remove switching loops. STP virtually blocks all ports that cause loops. We have two solutions to this problem. We can disable STP or use Ether channel. Disabling STP can cause loops. A network never works with loops. The second solution allows us to create multiple links without disabling STP. An Ether channel combines links into a single link. For example, if we create two links between these switches and configure an Ether channel, both will be visible as a single link to STP but will work as two links for switches. There are two types of Ether channels, static and dynamic. Static Ether channel needs manual configuration. Dynamic Ether channel uses an Ether channel protocol. The Ether channel protocol dynamically adds and manages links in the Ether channel. Cisco switches support two Ether channel protocols LACP and PAGP. IEEE developed LACP as an open standard protocol. It works with all vendors' switches. It can combine up to 16 links. However, it uses only 8 of them at a given time. It keeps remaining in the waiting. If any active link fails, it adds a waiting link to the pool. Cisco developed PAGP as a proprietary protocol. It works only on Cisco switches. It can combine up to 8 links. It works similarly to LACP but uses different terms for its modes. Cisco switches support both protocols. You can use anyone you want on Cisco switches. However, you can't use PAGP on non-Cisco switches. On Cisco switches, all methods use the same interface configuration command to configure the Ether channel. However, they use the different configuration options to form the Ether channel. We will discuss these options in detail later in this video. No matter which configuration method you choose, all Ether channels have some restrictions. You can't add any port to an Ether channel. All ports in an Ether channel must have the same speed, duplex, port type, VLAN configurations, and STP settings. Let us understand these requirements in detail. All ports in an Ether channel must have the same port speed. For example, we can create an Ether channel of fast Ethernet or gigabit Ethernet ports, but we can't create an Ether channel having both types. A switch port can work in two modes, half duplex and full duplex. In half duplex mode, it can either send or receive data at a given time. In full duplex mode, it can perform both actions at the same time. In an Ether channel, all ports must operate in the same mode. We can't combine a half duplex port with a full duplex port. VLANs allow us to create logical groups on the switch. If we use VLANs, the VLAN configuration must be the same on all ports. A VLAN configuration contains two port modes, access and trunk. In a typical VLAN configuration, a port can work in either access or trunk mode. If it works in access mode, it is called the access port. If it works in trunk mode, it is called the trunk port. An access port connects an end device to the switch. A trunk port connects another switch or a router to the switch. The main difference between both modes is that in access mode, 
the port does not add VLAN information to the frames before forwarding them, while in trunk mode, it adds VLAN information. We can add either all access or trunk ports to an Ether channel. We can't add both types of ports to the same Ether channel. We also need to ensure that all access ports in the Ether channel have the same VLAN ID. We can't add ports from different VLANs into the same Ether channel. Finally, we need to match STP parameters on all ports. If two ports have different STP configurations, we can't add them to the same Ether channel. If we manually configure an Ether channel, we need to check these parameters. If any of these parameters do not match, the Ether channel will not work. If we use LACP or PAGP, it automatically checks these parameters on ports before adding them to the Ether channel. If we configure an Ether channel, the Ether channel distributes traffic among all ports configured in it. Ether channel uses predefined rules for load balancing. These rules override the default frame processing function. Before we learn these rules, let us briefly discuss how a switch processes frames. A switch processes frames through three stages. These stages are learning, decision-making, and forwarding. In the learning stage, it learns the MAC addresses of connected devices and adds them to the CAM table. In the decision-making stage, it selects forwarding ports for incoming frames. In the forwarding stage, it forwards frames from ports selected in stage 2. It uses the source MAC address field of incoming frames to learn the MAC address of the connected devices and the destination MAC address field to make forwarding decisions. It uses the CAM table to save the MAC addresses of the connected devices. A CAM table entry contains a MAC address and an associate switch port. When the switch receives an incoming frame, it finds the destination MAC address of the frame in the CAM table. If it finds a matching entry in the CAM table, it forwards the frame from the port mentioned in the entry. The switch uses the source address of incoming frames to build CAM table entries and the destination address to make forwarding decisions. Let us understand this process in detail. PC1 sends a frame to PC3. The frame contains the source and destination MAC addresses. The frame reaches S1 on port F0-2. S1 adds an entry to the CAM table. This entry associates port F0-2 with MAC1. S1 finds MAC3 in the CAM table. Since the CAM table has no entry for MAC3, S1 decides to forward it from all ports, excluding the incoming port. The frame reaches S2 on port G0-2. S2 adds an entry to the CAM table. This entry associates port G0-2 with MAC1. S2 finds MAC3 in the CAM table. Since the CAM table has no entry for MAC3, S2 decides to forward it from all ports apart from the incoming port. The frame reaches PC3. PC3 replies to the frame. The frame reaches S2 on port F0-8. S2 adds an entry to the CAM table. This entry associates port F0-8 with MAC3. S2 finds MAC1 in the CAM table. Since the CAM table has an entry for MAC1, S2 decides to forward it from port G0-2. The frame reaches S1 on port G0-4. S1 adds an entry to the CAM table. This entry associates port G0-4 with MAC3. S1 finds MAC1 in the CAM table. Since the CAM table has an entry for MAC1, S1 decides to forward it from port F0-2. The frame reaches PC1. Switches repeat this process for all frames. However, if we configure an Ether channel, this process will change. After Ether channel configuration, switches assign MAC addresses to the Ether channel instead of the interfaces. Let us suppose we configure an Ether channel on these switches. PC1 generates another frame for PC3. The frame reaches S1 on F0-2. S1 adds an entry for MAC1 and forwards it from all ports besides the incoming port. Before the Ether channel configuration, there was only one link between these switches, so the process was straightforward. Now, the switches have an Ether channel. The Ether channel will decide the port that will forward the frame. The Ether channel uses various rules to select the forwarding port. These rules are called load balancing rules. We will discuss these rules a bit later. By now, let us suppose the Ether channel forwards the frame from G0-3. The frame reaches S2 on G0-1. Although S2 received this frame on G0-1, it will not add G0-1 to the CAM table. Instead of G0-1, it will add Pool 1 to the CAM table. Pool is a term Ether channel uses to refer to the group of ports. Since the CAM table has no entry for MAC3, the switch forwards it from all ports apart from the incoming port. PC3 receives the frame and replies with its frame. The frame reaches S2 on port F0-8. The switch adds an entry for MAC3 in the CAM table. 
The destination of the frame is Mac 1. The cam table of S2 has an entry for Mac 1. S2 uses this entry to make the forwarding decision. It gives the frame to pool 1. Pool 1 uses Ether channel load balancing rules to select the forwarding port. Let us suppose it selects G0 slash 1 as the forwarding port. The frame reaches S1 on G0 slash 3. Similar to S2, S1 associates MAC3 with PAL1 rather than G0 slash 3. The destination address of the frame is MAC1. Since the CAM table of S1 has an entry for MAC1, S1 forwards it from F0 slash 2. This way, if we configure an Ether channel, the switch uses Ether channel's pool number for the CAM table entries. It assigns the same pool number to all MAC addresses that it learns on any port of the pool. Ether channel uses load balancing rules to decide which physical port inside the pool will forward the incoming frame. All switches support MAC-based rules. IP-based rules depend on the model and software version of the switch. The default load balancing uses the source MAC addresses of incoming frames to select the forwarding port. Since all frames originating from a source have the same values in the header fields, the switch forwards them from the same port in the Ether channel. For example, in this network, if PC1 and PC3 communicate, this Ether channel will always use the same ports to forward their frames. It ensures that all messages in a single application use the same link of the Ether channel. It prevents the switch from inadvertently reordering the messages sent in that application flow by sending one message over a busy link while immediately sending another message out an unused link. Both sides of an Ether channel must use the same Ether channel type. For example, we can configure static Ether channel on both sides but we cannot configure static Ether channel on one side and dynamic Ether channel on another side. Since all Ether channel types use the same configuration command, we must use the appropriate configuration options. Static Ether channel uses the on option. LACP Ether channel uses active and passive options. PAGP uses auto and desirable options. The on option unconditionally enables Ether channel. If we use the on option on one side, we must use the on option on another side. We cannot use active, passive, auto, or desirable options on another side. LACP uses the active and passive options. If we configure the active option, the switch enables LACP on the port and sends hello messages. These hello messages contain the parameters we discussed earlier. If we configure the passive option, the switch does not enable LACP on the port but listens for LACP hello messages. If the port receives LACP hello messages, it matches the parameters. If the parameters match, it enables LACP on the port. With this condition, an Ether channel will form only when we configure at least one side of a link in the active mode. If we configure both ends in the passive mode, the Ether channel will not form. However, we can configure both ends in the active mode. But that will not be an optimal way. The best way is to configure one end in the active mode and another in the passive mode. It will ensure that an Ether channel will form only when all necessary parameters match. PAGP uses desirable and auto options. The desirable mode is similar to the active mode of LACP. In this mode, the switch enables PAGP and sends PAGP hello messages. In the auto mode, it listens for PAGP hello messages. If it receives them, it matches the parameters. If they match, it enables PAGP. If not, it keeps the port in the listening state. It ensures all ports in the Ether channel use identical configurations. So far, functionality is a concern, LACP and PAGP are the same. You can use anyone you like. If you have all Cisco switches, use PAGP, otherwise use LACP. If you use PAGP, configure one side as desirable and another as auto. If you use LACP, configure one side as active and the other as passive. That's all for this video. If you have any suggestions, comments, or feedback about this video, Please share them in the comment section given below.